Hi, Peter here from Wonderstruck. Now, everybody knows that the best possible colour for an LED is red. It's obvious. Wrong. There are some people out there, sad misguided fools they may be, whose favourite colour is actually yellow, green or even blue. Now, if you happen to be one of that unhappy minority and you find yourself in possession of a red LED, is there any possible way that you can change its colour? Well, yes it is, and it involves liquid nitrogen. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to put some LEDs into liquid nitrogen and see what happens to the colours. OK, let's start off with a red LED and see what happens when we lower its temperature to minus 196 degrees in a little flask of liquid nitrogen. So in goes the red LED. And immediately you can see the colour changing from red to a yellowy orange. And if we take the LED out, you can see that the tip is actually quite noticeably orange. And as it warms up again, it turns back to a nice red colour. So let's try a different colour. Let's try yellow this time. Now this really does give quite a noticeable change. So there we go. Nice bright yellow LED. Let's pop that into the liquid nitrogen. And you can see it's turning green. Actually quite a vivid green. And if we take it out... There we go, you can see that's a really nice bright green. And as it starts to warm up again, again, it reverts to its yellow colour. So the big question is, why? Now, before we can understand why the colour changes when you put the diode, the LED, into liquid nitrogen, we need to understand a bit about how an LED actually works. So firstly, LED stands for light emitting diode and they're made from semiconductor materials. Now, a semiconductor is just a material which has an electrical conductivity halfway between good conductors, such as metals, and good insulators, such as glass. So they sit somewhere in the middle. Now, if that was all there was to them, they wouldn't really be that interesting. But they have another uh, kind of property, if you like, that makes them much more interesting and much more useful. And that's the ability to accept impurities which can be used to control their electrical conductivity. And we call this process of adding the impurities doping. And we call the impurities themselves dopants. Now, <clears throat> there are two uh, types of doping, if you like. Uh, the first we call N-type doping. Because what we're doing, we're introducing atoms, the impurity, the dopant, which have extra electrons, more electrons than the atoms which make up the crystal lattice of the semiconductor. So when those atoms are in place, those extra electrons are free to roam around the internal structure of the semiconductor. So they uh, are able to transmit an electric current because they're negative charge carriers. Now that's where the N for N-type comes from, N for negative. So the other type of doping is P-type doping. And in this case, we're introducing impurity atoms, dopants, which have less electrons than the ele uh, atoms that make up the structure of the semiconductor. So when these atoms are in place, they're actually providing, if you like, the lack of an electron. And we call this a hole. And in certain ways, it can be considered to be a positive charge carrier. Now, it's not a real particle. It's really the absence of a particle. But as a means to understanding how these things work, it's a very useful device because it means our semiconductors have negative charge carriers moving one way and positive charge carriers moving the other way. So they uh, transfer, if you like, transmit an electrical current in a different way to any other substance. If you look at conductors like metals, they use negative charge carriers, the electrons just moving in one direction. There are no holes in the metal to move in the other direction. So in a semiconductor, you've got two types of charge carrier, the negative electrons and the positive 
holes. Okay, so how does a hole actually move if it's not a real particle? Well, if you imagine a row of people sat at the cinema, uh, here's the screen, here's a row of people are represented by little bits of chocolate. Now, imagine that the person in the aisle seat decides they need to leave early. So they vacate their seat and disappear from the cinema. The person next to them thinks, hmm, that aisle seat looks better than the seat I'm in, I'll get a better view. So they move one across. So our empty seat has now effectively moved from here to here. Now the person next to that empty seat thinks, well this seat is better than my seat, so I'm going to move one across as well. So now the hole has moved from its original starting position here to here. And then the person at the end of the row thinks, I'm going to move as well, so the hole is now here. So that's how a hole moves through the structure of a semiconductor. Well, that's all very well and good, but what's it got to do with LEDs? Now, the next thing we need to think about is the D in LED, because it stands for diode, light emitting diode. And a diode is a simple electronic device which only allows current to pass in one direction. Now, if you take two pieces of semiconductor, a piece of P-type and a piece of N-type, and you join them together, an interesting thing happens. You end up with a device called a PN junction, which acts like a diode. Now, when these two pieces are joined together, you have a joint, obviously. Now, what can happen is that charge carriers from either side can diffuse across that joint. So we have electrons from the N-type semiconductor diffusing across the joint into the p-type where they combine with the holes and you have the holes from the p-type diffusing across the barrier into the n-type where they combine with the free electrons. Now as that happens you're building up a stored charge around that joint. Now that stored charge creates an electric field and as the stored charge gets greater the electric field gets greater. Now the thing with the field is that it's actually opposing the diffusion. So once it reaches a certain strength the diffusion stops. It can't carry on because the electric field is too strong. Now the upshot of that is you end up with something called a depletion layer between the two semiconductors around the boundaries. Very thin layer and there are no free charge carriers in that area. So it's a depletion layer or depletion zone. Now if you take your PN junction and you connect it up to a battery, an external voltage source, this will apply an electric field and it will try to make the charge carriers move in a certain direction. Now if your external electric field is in line with the field around the depletion layer, then a current will pass through your PN junction. If the external electric field is the other way round, so you've reversed the polarities of your battery, then charge carriers cannot pass across the depletion zone. And that is basically how a PN junction acts like a diode. Ta-da! At last we're in a position where we can understand why an LED emits light and why that light changes colour when we subject the LED to a big temperature change. Now, when an electron moves from a high energy state to a lower energy, energy state, that energy has to go somewhere and it's emitted in the form of a photon, a particle of light. Now, the energy of that photon depends on the amount of energy that the electron has to lose as it changes from the high energy state to the low energy state. If those two states of energy are a long way apart, the photon emitted has a lot of energy and we see that, if it's in the visible spectrum, to be towards the blue end of the visible spectrum. If those two energy states are close together then the photon emitted will have less energy and we will see that towards the red end of the spectrum. Now, electrons that are moving freely through the semiconductor have a high energy state. 
when they combine with a hole, they're effectively binding to an atom. Now, a bound electron has a lower energy state. So as those electrons move around through the semiconductor, they're binding with holes, becoming attached to atoms, and in the process, losing energy. And that energy is emitted as a photon of light. So by choosing carefully the semiconductor materials we use and the things that we dope them with, we can adjust the size of the energy gap between the free electrons and the bound electrons. And that dictates the color of light that we see emitted from the LED. Now, if we take our LED and we dunk it into liquid nitrogen, that further reduces the energy level of the bound electron. So there's a bigger energy gap when that LED is made very cold. And if there's a bigger energy gap, we have a higher energy photon emitted. So it looks like our LED light is blue shifted. So it's actually moved slightly towards the blue end of the spectrum. And that's what we saw when we put the red LED into the liquid nitrogen it gave off a kind of yellowy orange light. So if we remember back to our kind of high school physics, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, that's the visible spectrum in order of energy. So red shifts to orangey yellow. When we put the yellow LED in, it turned green. So again, it's moving from yellow to green, a higher energy light. So there we go. It's all to do with the liquid nitrogen lowering the energy level of the bound state electron so we have a much bigger energy gap, so the photons emitted are higher energy. Right, there's actually two buts. So let's try first of all another red LED. Now this is a different LED to the one that we tried originally. Uh, so let's put this into the liquid nitrogen. Now you can see, colour's not really changing that much, if at all. And what happens is the LED simply goes out. If we let it warm up again, it comes back on. Now the reason this happens is because semiconductors actually have what we call a negative temperature coefficient. Now if you heat up a metal, as it gets hot, it becomes a less efficient conductor because the atoms that make up the metal lattice are jiggling about, the electrons collide with them, it's harder for them to move through the lattice, so it's not such a good conductor. A semiconductor, on the other hand, works in the opposite way. As you heat it up, you release more electrons to become free conduction electrons, so it becomes a better conductor. And conversely, when you cool it down, you lose electrons from the conduction state, so it becomes a less good conductor. Now obviously with our liquid nitrogen we've reached a temperature where it pretty much stops conducting at all and hence we don't get any light from it. Now let's try a second but because here we have a green LED. Now based on what we've said as you cool down your LED the electrons which are in the bound state are actually losing more energy, so the band gap, the energy gap between them and the conduction electrons is higher, so when a photon is emitted it's a higher energy photon. Based on that we would expect our green LED, when it's cooled down, to emit a bluer light. So now let's have a look at what happens. As you can see, before it goes out, for the reasons we've just discussed, it went yellow. Now that obviously isn't anything that fits in with what we've just said. Now the reason for that is that LEDs are all made from lots of different types of semiconductor with lots of different types of dopants. Now some of them have the effect that when you cool them down, the conduction electrons actually lose more energy than the bound state electrons, so it has the effect of actually closing the energy gap so that the photons emitted at low temperature are actually lower energy, and that's what's happening here. Instead of blue photons being emitted, we're seeing yellow photons which are lower energy because that band gap has actually closed a little bit and we've got lower energy photons emitted as a result. So there we go.
several different kind of phenomena there, all related to the same kind of mechanism. But that's how LEDs work, and that's why their colour changes when you subject them to a large temperature change.